First, we're going to have a, a Bible story led by Laura Lee using the simply the story method. And then I'll come back and share a brief message. And then Laura Lee will come again and give us a ministry report from a recent international ministry opportunity. So let's have our story first. So I've asked these four brave souls to help me with this um, <laughs> due to the, to the time that I have available. Um, if I had longer, you all would be helping me. So you can thank them later. <laughs> so before we um, take a look at God's word and dig into it, let's, let's talk to God. Father God, I just... Thank you for this opportunity uh, that we have to look into your word. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth that you have for us um, in this story. In your son's name, amen. So before I start with the story, um, God had created a perfect world. And through disobedience to God, sin, people ruined that perfect world. In the time of this story, most of the people have forgotten the Lord, and they're living as pagans, worshiping idols, worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. And Abram, who is in our story, was born and raised and living in a pagan country. His wife, Sarai, is barren. She's not able to have children. Uh, Lot is mentioned in this story, and he is Abram's nephew. And this story takes place before God changes Abram's name to Abraham. And this story is part of God's unfolding plan to deal with that sin and disobedience that's in the world. And that's where our story will start. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you all of the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham, Abram left as the Lord had said to him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. And that's the end of the story. So now I'm wondering if you will help me with the story. Let's go through it one more time and, and you guys help me. So the Lord said to Abram, get out, yeah, get out of your country. country and from your family and whose house? Your father's house, right. And where was Abram supposed to go? To a land? Right, that God had picked, that God was going to show him. Yeah, it was unknown at the time, right. And God was going to make Abram what kind of a nation? a great nation, and he was going to bless him and do what to his name? Make it great. You can use the microphone too. You got to hold it close to your mouth with that one. Um, <laughs> and Abram would be a blessing. And what was God going to do to the people that blessed Abram? Yeah, yeah. and to the ones that cursed Abram? Right. And so Abram then said, this is too crazy of a plan. There's no way I'm doing this. No. <laughs> Abram left according to what the Lord had said. And Lot went with him. And do you remember how old Abram was? 75, 75 when he left Haran. Nice job. Thank you guys. So Abram is 75 years old. And God has told him to get out of his country from his family and his father's house and go to a land that God will show him. 
I'm wondering what might it have felt like to be Abram at this age and stage in his life to be told to do these things. He probably was somewhat afraid. What do you think would make him afraid? What? Going to another place that he didn't know okay. anybody or anything. Yeah, you don't know anyone? It was unknown. What, what does he even take with him? Or he has to take everything with him. Yeah. Be, be, I would think there'd be some fear, just that unknown, leaving everything that's secure to you, safe. Ask why? I would, if he, uh, why should I do this? Yeah. So what might we learn about the Lord that he told Abram to leave his country and his family? You know, we know from the intro that it's a pagan country. Um, what, what might we learn about the Lord that, that he's telling him to do these things, get away from these things? Well, that Lord wanted to get him away from the influence of his present surroundings. Okay. Is there anything else the Lord could have, could have done there or could have said to him? Well, he could have told him to stay and go out and preach his word. Could have. True. Yeah. So he says, you know, go to the land that I will show you. How is Abraham going to find that land? What's, what's he going to have to do to, to know where this is? He's going to have to trust God. God's going to have to show him where to go. He's going to have to convince him that he's the right man for this responsibility. Mm. Yeah. He's also, he's going to have to keep in constant or daily contact with God. Uh, however, he's doing that because that's the only way he'd know where to go day by day. Right. Yeah, that constant communication. Go to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great. What might we learn about the Lord? That he says those things to Abram when his wife can't have children. That God has the magnificent ability to bring something about that just doesn't make sense. How can he be a father of many, a great nation, when he has no offspring? Yeah. And his wife is barren. Besides, he's old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. What might we learn about the Lord and how he feels toward all these families of the earth? Well, that the Lord is omnipresent and omnipotent. He knows the end result already. It's just convincing Abram that this is the direction to go to fulfill God's purpose, which he already knows. And I mean, God already knows. Mm -hmm. Could he have chosen other people? You know, he's saying, I'll bless all the families in the earth through you, you know, and most of them have forgotten him at this point, could he, have, could he have done anything differently at this point, the Lord? Well, obviously, the Lord has chosen the person that he feels is in communication with him, and, um, it, and, he, and he will trust him. It's, it's interesting, because when you think, um, Abraham longs for the things that the Lord is promising him. Hmm probably as a as an old man but the lord could have also chosen anybody that he wanted to he could have chosen a younger man he could have chosen a man and wife who's you know who could have children at the time but god has a tendency to choose the most unlikely candidate sometime to show 
how great he really is and how in control he really is. Yeah. Yeah. So Abram leaves as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him and he was 75 years old when he left Haran. Could Abram have made any other choices? He's 75 and he leaves everything he knows. Stay. I mean, he could have turned God down. Yeah. And I, I believe that God would have found somebody else. So it was important if you, that he take that opportunity to serve God. Right. What kind of impact might it have had on Abram if he hadn't done what God asked of him? He would have had the influence of all those bad people. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. He might have lost his contact with God because... Uh, or, yeah, I don't, God wouldn't leave him, but he, if he's not going to follow God, God's crazy. I'm not going to follow that. And he just sat down and stayed. Um, probably yeah. would have wondered what. <laughs> well, and, the, and in the end, the blessings that he received, if he'd have stayed, his whole family life might have deteriorated. He wouldn't have had the offspring. Mm -hmm. uh, could have lost everything that he had had he stayed there. Yeah. So might we learn anything more about him and his relationship with the Lord because he does go? He trusted the Lord mm -hmm. completely, I think. Yeah. Abram was a, a man of faith. He had the opportunity to follow God or not to follow God, and he chose to follow God and to trust him step by step. Mm. Yeah. So we've seen in this story how Abram chose to leave everything, everything that maybe brought him comfort and security and take that huge step of faith. Does that ever happen today? that people choose to leave behind things that they hold near and dear or are comfortable to them to be obedient to the Lord? Oh, it does. Why would somebody from California come to Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is where I'd like to include everybody. So what about you or someone that you know? Have you chosen to leave things behind that have been sources of security for you or comfort to take a step of obedience to the Lord? You guys can answer too if you want. Well, uh, yes, and speaking for us, 31 and a half years ago, we chose to leave a practice where I was the owner of the veterinary clinic we were at uh, because we couldn't see raising our kids there. And we actually asked for a sign from God that we were supposed to move up here and he did very powerfully to us. And ha can I ask, have you seen blessings? In <laughs> <laughs> well, other than being asked to be on the deacon board a number of times, uh, there's been a lot of blessings in the time. We no, that has too. This ended up being the perfect place hmm. to raise our family. And and the integral part of uh, Faith Bridge uh, and the fellowship here. Um, yeah, we wouldn't have had if we'd have, I won't call it a pagan land we moved from, but, uh, but yeah, I can't see that, uh, that, we, that God would have had the impact on us down there that he did up mm -hmm. here. Cool. So one final question that we'll just leave open-ended. So is there anything in this story that could help you in the future if God asks you to leave something behind or give something up 
or maybe go to a different land? Is there something in the story that could help you in the future to be completely obedient to the Lord as Abram was? Let's close in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this story and this amazing testimony of Abram who at 75 years old was so willing to obey you. Father, thank you for the challenge that that brings to us, but also the encouragement as we see your goodness and your faithfulness. Father, just work in our hearts and our lives that we would choose to have that same commitment and obedience. In your son's name, amen. Thank you, guys. So they had no idea what questions I was going to ask. <laughs> they were very willing to be, to be brave and come up here. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yes, thank you for that story. There's a lot in that story about Abraham's character, Abraham's call, the plan of God that he would carry out through Abraham. We're only going to focus on, on part of that this morning. By the way, I'm going to stand over here to the side because so, we'll be referring to some, uh, several verses on the screen, so I want to be able to look that way. You can go ahead and show the first one. A minute ago, we sang a song called Song for the Nations, and it struck me singing those lines, may we be a shining light to the nations till the whole world sees the glory of your name. I thought, wow, that is really good New Testament theology there, the Great Commission. That's Jesus commanded his disciples to go out and take the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? But what I want to share with you in the next few minutes is that that is actually whole Bible theology. That is a, a theme or a thread that runs literally from Genesis to Revelation. And I want to just highlight that for you briefly this morning, starting with the story that we just heard and the final part of, of what God said to, to Abram there, which is found in Genesis 12, verse 3, where God said to Abram, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. If you're looking at a different translation, it might say families. Just a note that, that the original Hebrew word there means something more like a clan or a tribe. It's not a family like my family of six. It's a big, it's a big group. So here it's translated the peoples or what we might call a people group. Well, this, so this is the beginning of the development of this theme that I see running through the whole Bible. And go to the next slide. We see several examples in the Psalms. This is just a a brief sample. In the Psalms, it says, Psalm 9, 11, sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. And then in 47, 1, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. So we see God having a focus on the nations, people all over the earth. Next, still in the Psalms, we, we read this earlier, actually, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. 117.1, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. You see a theme developing here? Let's go on to Isaiah. Isaiah 45, 2. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Isaiah 49, 6. I will also make you a light for Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, Pastor Ken mentioned earlier, this presentation was supposed to be made at the end of the Christmas season, but we got snowed out. But you'll recognize that second passage there as a familiar Christmas passage. It's a, it's a messianic prophecy where God is talking, is, is prophesying into the future when he would send his son, the Messiah, to be a light for the Gentiles so that his salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So in a couple of these um, examples, we see, the, we see the outreach part. We see that God wants to be worshipped by the peoples of the earth. 
he wants his salvation to reach to the ends of the earth and and that and that implies implies outreach there somehow that message has to go out to the people of the earth okay well our fi- in our very quick survey of the old testament our final reference is in daniel now this is a little bit different because this is daniel having a vision of the future he sees the end of the story how this is all going to play out and what he sees in the future in his vision is he sees the throne of God, and there he, it says that all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. So it looks like God's plan is going to be successful, right? We have a, a picture of the end here. Okay, well, that's a quick survey of the Old Testament. Let's turn to the New Testament. By the way, if I, if I had to do this over again, I would have the words down lower so I don't have to look up like that, but we'll, we'll figure that out next time. Um, okay. Galatians chapter 3 verse 8, Paul writing here a a rather lengthy uh, discourse about Abraham. In fact, some of the things that we heard in the story this morning about Abram's faith and his commitment to God. Here he says that the whole statement is that the scripture announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, quote, all nations will be blessed through you. Does that sound familiar? Have you heard that lately? about five minutes ago, right? So what is intriguing to me here is that Paul is referencing that Old Testament passage. He's referring to the very story that we just heard from long, long ago, from very early in the, in the biblical um, record. And he basically calls that the gospel. He says that that was the gospel. God was proclaiming the gospel to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So again, we see, I think we see a real close link here between the New Testament proclamation of the gospel, the, the Great Commission, and all those aspects that we find in the New Testament linked with this very promise that God made to Abraham long ago and all those references throughout the Old Testament to God's love for the nations. Let's look at another example involving Paul again. This is in Acts thirteen forty seven. The context here is that Paul and Barnabas had attempted to preach the gospel to the Jews, but they were rejected, and, they, and Paul said, okay, we'll turn to the Gentiles. And then he says, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. And what does he quote? He quotes that messianic prophecy, that Christmas passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 49, where it says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I have made who a light? The Messiah. This is God's plan. This is God's plan to send his son to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But Paul interprets that as a commandment to him and to us. In other words, God has this plan that from long ago to bless the nations of the earth but it's not a spectator sport. It's not something that God's going to do by himself or even through his Messiah. It's a commandment. It's a responsibility that he's given to us. And, and Paul saw that clearly. Okay, finally, I think, yes, um, our last um, reference here in, the, in our quick New Testament survey is from Revelation 7-9. And Pastor Ken shared that with us earlier. This, again, is a, is a look into the future Just like Daniel saw a vision of the future, John saw a similar vision, looking ahead to a great multitude gathered around the throne of God, too many to count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. So again, we see that God has has always had a love for the peoples of the earth, a desire to be worshipped by them, and a plan to call them together, and his plan is going to succeed and we have a part in that plan. Well, now I'd like to shift our focus a little bit to something more, something tangible. Um, and of course, it will be Indonesia. That's what I always talk about when I, and I wear my Indonesian batik shirt. But this time it's not about me. It's about um, an opportunity that Laura Lee had recently. But as a brief background, you've heard a lot from us about Indonesia. I would refer to it in this context as a nation of peoples We've talked about the nations. We've talked about people groups. Indonesia is a nation made up of hundreds, about 700 distinct people groups. And 
over thousands of islands, and this represents the languages. Um, on the next slide, uh, just a reminder that my family has spent a lot of time there. And this is on the island of Borneo, where we lived in those days when the girls were, were littler. And one of my jobs there was to do what we call language survey. Next, please. In the picture on the left, you see me in a boat there with our survey crew. We're going around uh, trying to determine where the, the Bible translation needs were. And we're also doing literacy survey. We're trying to evaluate how well people can read. And often the results were um, indicated that they don't read very well. And this is true all over the world. A lot of people around the world are, are not good readers. So the picture on the right, which is actually from a different place, it shows how happy people are when they get the Bible in their language. And of course, that is a wonderful thing, and we celebrate that. But we recognize that behind the smiles, um, there are many people who actually can't read it or can't read it well, and they need to be reached in other ways. So we talk a lot these days about oral, oral methods of communicating the gospel and communicating Bible truth to people. And one of those, one of the methods that's commonly used is the simply the story method that we heard that was demonstrated for us earlier. And recently, in October, I believe, Laura Lee had the opportunity to go to Indonesia to help train people in this method. And the next slide you see, the arrow indicates the small island of Rote where she went to uh, lead this workshop. And she's now going to tell us about that. So as David mentioned, Simply the Story is a method um, of communicating God's word in an oral fashion, which is what you saw me do um, up here. This is the method that I go and teach people how to do this process of Bible storytelling in the workshops where I'm an instructor. Uh, so four of us traveled to Kupang, Timor in October, and one instructor and myself went to the small island of Rote. Um, here we're waiting to board that ferry in the back, which is going to be a two-hour ride um, over to Rote Island. Um, one of the gals there was our translator, and the others had been through some advanced training with Simply the Story, and they were supposed to have been trained well enough that they could be our small group leaders to help train others in the workshop on Rote Island. But we discovered on the first day of the workshop that they didn't understand the method well enough and they weren't able to help us. So we ended up, um, my teammate and I, had to work to train them to be assistant instructors while at the same time training the other people as they just started to learn the method. Go ahead. Um, this is the church where the workshop was held on Rote Island. Five languages were represented in this workshop. Um, my teammate and I presented everything in English, and then it was translated into Kupang Malay, which was the third or fourth language for all of the people that were attending. It wasn't the mother tongue for any of them. And that presented some challenges for us, just that language barrier. Um, it, I wrote in my journal on the third day of the workshop, I have moments in the workshop where I think they're understanding the STS method, and then a train wreck happens. <laughs> and I wrote that more than once. <laughs> so the workshop challenged me and grew me as an instructor, and it was just really exciting to see as the week went on, people understand the process and grasp it and get real excited to share uh, about it to share God's word with other people. The woman that's standing here in this picture um, originally came to the workshop just to see what the people in her mission organization were learning. She sat with her arms folded most of the time and just seemed very suspicious and very unwelcoming. So when we broke up into our small groups, 
I invited her to join the group that I was leading. We were preparing a Bible story um, that one of, the tri- one of the members in the group then would go and present um, and receive coaching on. And when she joined the group, again, she just sat there and wouldn't say anything. But as our discussion of the story went on, slowly her arms relaxed and it wasn't long and she started joining in the discussion with us. And a day or so later, I asked if she would have interest in presenting a Bible story to one of the groups. And she quickly said yes. She really enjoyed the method and it was just fun to see how her demeanor changed through the time. This is one of the groups practicing. Um, The woman standing up is presenting a story like what you saw me do up here. Um, This this practice time is invaluable in the workshops. They learn learn a Bible story and then get to present it. And then afterwards they receive coaching on what did they do well as a storyteller and what's one thing that they could do to be even better the next time they tell a story. What would you do if you were standing in line at a grocery store or coffee shop or Walmart and you got into a conversation with the person that you didn't know in front of you and you only had five minutes? Could you, could you share a Bible story in that amount of time? In the workshop, we train people how to do that. If you only have five minutes with somebody, how can you do a Bible story? And so this is where they're practicing. Um, The one row is given a scenario. um, Say they're at Caribou, standing in line, and they get into a conversation with the person in the other row who's a complete stranger. We give them one or two minutes to get the conversation started, and then five minutes to do a Bible story with that person. And so this is a, a picture of them practicing that. And that is the group from Rote Island. Um, The men that had been part of the workshop had had to leave already for other responsibilities by the time this picture was taken, which is why it's predominantly women in here. Um, But it was a, a great, great group. One woman had left the workshop early on Thursday afternoon. Um, she had a children's ministry that she needed to go and take care of. And she told me later when she came back that she had told the Bible story that she had learned um, and had presented during the workshop. And the children were so excited. They asked for more stories. Um, On Rote Island and I think, well, I, I would guess throughout Indonesia, I know this was true in Haiti where I've been, they, the children are not taught in school how to think critically and how to think for themselves. It's rote memorization of everything. And so the, simply the story process, as you can see, you have to think about it. You have to think about what other choices could characters in the story do. And so the children just really loved that they were able to, to think. And it wasn't just rote answers that were being looked for. And this woman happened to be married to the headmaster at the school, and she would go home in the evenings and tell him about what she was learning in the workshop and some of the questions that we would use to get discussion of the story going. And he became so excited about that, he is now incorporating many of those same questions into the school atmosphere. Um, If a child gets into trouble, you know, what other choice could you have made? What can we learn because you did make this choice? So it's fun to see the impact that simply the story had, not in a venue that we were really expecting, but it's it's having an impact over there. Um, This was the first ever STS workshop held on Rote Island. In a small way, I can relate to Abram. God had made it very clear to me that I was supposed to go on this trip. Although there were some things going on personally that made it very, very difficult for me to leave. Um, On the last day of the workshop, I journaled, I walked through this open door that God gave me and truly was blessed. 
What an honor to have been the first instructor to do an STS workshop on Rote Island. It's hard to say goodbye. Amazing how bonds form without a common language. And the Lord is at the center of it all. So may he receive all the glory and praise for what's going on over there. Thank you, Laura Lee, for sharing that and for your willingness to go on that and follow God in that um, outreach. Let's, let's close this part of our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to hear your word proclaimed this morning, a story from long ago that reveals your heart for the nations. And thank you for the opportunities that we have had as, as a church to be involved in ministry around the world over the years. And we thank you for your love for us, and we praise you for you are indeed worthy to be worshipped by all people everywhere. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.